Check Podcasts. Welcome back to House Guests. There's so many important things when you're looking at investing in real estate or your future for that matter. I've got one of my favorite guests on the show today, Sybil Verge. Sybil has so much experience with her own TV show on chat called The Wealthy Life. Welcome. Amy, thanks. It's so great to be here. I tell you, money and uh, houses, real estate, decorating, they all go together. It's true. And I mean, they're all expensive things too. So it's really questions about how we spend our money, where do we start, all of that. But before we get into it, I want the viewers to hear about who you are and how you got into the industry. Because I'm sure you didn't necessarily want to be in, like in investing in the beginning or did you? I don't know. Well, no, I didn't. I hadn't a clue. I didn't know that this was a career option for me. Yeah. What I do know is when I was a little girl, I love numbers. I love finance. I love budgeting. I love saving. I loved helping people. I was always good at math, but I thought mm -hmm. I'd be an accountant because that's what you do if you're good at math. And that's then it, true. it was a co-op work experience while I was finishing my commerce degree at the University of Victoria that opened the door for me in the world of finance and wealth management. I was in uh, the firm for about three days, a previous firm, and I knew mm -hmm. this was the career path for me. It kind of brought all those elements together, all the things that I loved the most and the things that I was good at and brought them all together. And I've built a, a very rewarding and successful career over the years as a result. You really have. And one thing that I love about it, and it's kind of what I've done as well, you've started with your core, but then you've, inve or you've, you've branched out in investment. So there's all different angles, including a TV show which, you know, I don't think we start out with those things and then the opportunities present themselves and you jump on it. Absolutely. I mean, if somebody had told me 20 years ago that I would be producing and hosting a television show, I would have thought they were crazy. That's right? not, that wasn't on my bucket list or it wasn't yes. even something that crossed my mind. But what got me interested in that in the first place was as a financial advisor, years ago, I realized I was answering the same questions over and over for the average Canadian. These are things people don't know. They don't know whether they're better to pay down debt or save for retirement. Should they put their money in an RSP or a TFSA? Mm -hmm. um, how should they invest their money? How do they save taxes? I mean, the list goes on. And when I realized that the same questions were being asked over and over again, it piqued my interest. I thought, well, mm -hmm. me just sitting down one-on-one -on -one with an individual is going to take a long time to educate a lot of people. So right. why don't we leverage the power of television? Uh, mm -hmm. and, and educate more people at once. And if we can increase financial literacy across the country, well, across the mm -hmm. world, but let's just start yes. with Canada. <laughs> but if we can increase financial literacy, it makes such a huge difference in people's lives. Most people, they get frustrated or bored, to be frank, mm -hmm. when it comes to money and their eyes glaze over. It's not nearly as exciting as buying a house or putting new paint and flooring and cabinets and decorating and, and design work. I mean, that's fun. That's immediate gratification. When it comes to finance, it's longer term. And because yes. people don't have that immediate gratification, it, it becomes less interesting until it matters. Mm -hmm. And, when and I think it, too, it can be kind of scary for them as well, because with all the ups and downs in the downturns, that's when people get scared. Yep. And they're not necessarily thinking about the long term anymore. No. And people to make smart investment decisions, you need to mm -hmm. think longer term. And we know it, making money actually is really easy. You want to know the secret? I do. <laughs> <laughs> Buy low, sell high. Okay. Yes. Well, we all know that. It's obvious. But human mm -hmm. nature wants to do exactly the opposite. When markets are really volatile or dropping and things look scary out there, then people want to sell because they're scared. And yes. when things are booming and everyone seems to be making money on a particular stock or a sector mm -hmm. or just in the markets in general, that's when everyone wants to buy. Well, you got to do the opposite. Um, yeah. So and, and have a plan and stick to it. But having a plan might be a little boring. I'd like to bring sexy back to finance. Do you think that's I possible? <laughs> I would love that. Let's make it fun. Yes. And part of it too is like, do you think that for our generation, it's harder to 
to do that? Because especially in real estate, I mean, everything's high. Yes, yes. Well, I, I yes and no. I think that every generation is a little bit different. I think going mm -hmm. back to my parents and grandparents' generation, nobody talked about money at all. And there's a right. little bit more discussion around money today, but money is still one of those taboo subjects that people are a little bit hesitant or resistant to talk to one another and open up, hey, I make this much money. I save mm -hmm. this much money. This is my portfolio. Um, people don't talk like that because it's very, very private. And as yes. a result of that, people don't learn. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it, it's kind of a, a little bit of a, a negative implication at the end of the day. Now, I'm, I'm not saying we should all open up and share all of our personal and private information because that could get in the wrong hands and then you got to deal true. with scammers and fraudsters. But I think it's healthy to have an open dialogue, parents with their kids, mm -hmm. grandparents with their grandchildren, close friends that you can trust one another. And you don't have to share how much you make or any of that, but you can talk about what are ways you invest and what percentage of your income are you saving? Mm -hmm. If you talk in percentage terms, you're not telling dollars. And exactly. at least it allows people to compare to one another and in a good way. So mm -hmm. there's comparing yourself to others that can be deflating and unhealthy because right. you want to feel good about yourself. But yeah. then there's comparing from a benchmark perspective to make sure, like, are you doing the things that you should be doing? Now, of course, right. the easiest person to share with is a professional like a yes. financial advisor or an accountant or a lawyer because you're paying them to listen and to give you mm -hmm. good advice. So I recommend that for everyone. I think there's a lot of people around us, though, too, who can share and help and, and really help us learn. Because I know, like you said, I'm not a numbers person. I think with the other side of the brain, I'm very creative and scattered and I'm not organized and such. So I don't necessarily like to learn about finance and numbers from books. I love to hear the stories and put into pr special practices where I can relate to that. You know what? You just hit the nail on the head and you're not alone. And I think mm -hmm. that's the approach that advisors need to start taking with their clients. And as an industry, we need to come at things from that angle. Storytelling mm -hmm. is powerful. You want it to is. tap into the emotional side of things. One of, the, yes. one of the questions I used to ask clients, new clients, when I would bring them on, which by the way, I'm no longer an advisor. I don't take on clients right. <laughs> today. Sold, You're busy enough as it is. Sold my practice years ago, but I work with mm -hmm. a lot of fantastic advisors. One of the best questions I could ask in that first meeting is, imagine you just won $20 million on the lottery. Yes. What does your life look like? How do you spend it? Oh. And, and I mean, Amy, what comes to mind? How, what, if you just won $20 million, what would you do? Build a house. Okay. You would build <laughs> yeah. a house and yes. what would that build house a house be? I've designed. Okay. So you would, what else would you do? Cause it's not going to cost you $20 million. I don't think. No, it's <laughs> not. I think I would hide after that in my house and just, <laughs> <laughs> you know, kind of, cause I feel like that would be very overwhelming. And I think even on a smaller scale, I, I'm like a lot of people, I'm like, okay, that's a lot to process and take in to make that plan. I could think of one thing, but what do I do next? <laughs> Yeah. And I think without overcomplicating it, what most people say is they either would buy a house or they'd pay off their mortgage on their existing house or maybe upgrade. Right. Um, they maybe would go on a trip because they they just need to get away from everyone and kind of think through what they're going to do next. Um, yes. They want to help out family members is another common thing. They want to help pay off mortgages or buy houses or vehicles for others. Mm -hmm. Maybe they buy a summer cottage and maybe they buy a ski boat. Um, and then mm -hmm. the other thing that comes up is they want to support causes they believe in. They want to help those right. less fortunate. They maybe want to build a school in Africa or mm -hmm. whatever the case may be. But the really cool thing about asking that question is we get to the outcomes that people are looking for and the feeling right. that gives them, the joy that that gives them and the planning of like you designing a house and getting to build it from scratch and not having to worry about money like it's exciting. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. So once we list all those goals, like, and, and, and some people may say they stop working. Others say they go part-time or maybe they start a new company because you still need purpose. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I would you... never be able to stop working. No. I, just, I mean, even if I had a lemonade, a lemonade stand at the end of the driveway, I just, 
would be trying something new. Well, you got to do something. There's you, We have to have purpose. And, yes. you know, retirement is not a 30 year long weekend. So what no. you would have planned for a long weekend or a vacation is not the same things you're going to plan for a 30 year time period in your life. Right. So when, you know, what is it that you're going to do to fill your days? So we, we tap into that as well and, and having that purpose. But back to the lottery winnings. Here's the cool thing. So now people mm -hmm. start getting excited about what they want to accomplish because money is just a means to an end. It, it it's is, not yeah. like people, in my opinion, people focus too much on the actual dollars and mm -hmm. not about what it is they want the dollars to do for them. That's it's kind of a vehicle that gets you to where you can do the things you want to do. Yeah. And guess what? You know, some people look at that vehicle as a Tesla. Some look at it <laughs> right. as a scooter or a Honda Civic. Um, right. There's a lot of different vehicles and there's different quality of vehicles and yes. cost of vehicles that can get you there. So when I start with the lottery question, it really gets rid of all of the negative mindset that people have. People jump to, but I can't, or I don't want to plan, or I don't think it's possible. Mm -hmm. Well, if you don't think it's possible, you're not going to set it as a goal typically yeah. in the first place. And then that's a feeling of being deflated and you give up. Well, that's a terrible place to be. But yes. now when you know, well, you've just won 20 million, you can do anything you want. That's the starting point for the next discussion. So now we've got a list of all the goals. You want to buy a house, mm -hmm. you want to retire one day, you want to send your kids to university, you want to help charities, whatever those things look like, buy your summer cottage. Now we put a plan in place. How can you accomplish all of those things that you've said you would do without winning the lottery? Because guess what? Yes. You can you can. Absolutely. You know that family vacation or that big trip that you wanted to go on right away because you just wanted to run away from everybody and think? Well, mm -hmm. you can go on a trip. You don't need to win the lottery. No, you don't exactly. Need, you don't need to win the lottery to buy a house. You don't need to win the lottery to help charity and help other people out. You can do all those things. They may look a little bit different and you get creative on how you get there and then you start mm -hmm. prioritizing. And that's the basis of the plan. When you're having a meeting with then your financial advisor, you get to bring the creative side. You get to bring to the table what you want to do and what your outcomes are. And yes. then let the planner do the detail and work out the technical and say, okay, Amy, you know what? In order to do all these things, you need to save $1,000 a month. And you need to put <laughs> 200 of that into a high rate savings for your emergency fund. And 800 of that is going to go into a combination of RSP and TFSAs to achieve these other goals. And mm -hmm. here's how we're going to invest your money and everything's going to work out. And, and they'll explain it to you, but all of a sudden explaining you in a way that makes sense because now you know the why and the what it's going to accomplish at the end of the day. And it's your story. You're not just looking at a bunch of numbers. You're planning for your goals. Yes. Yes. Now, I'm not sure if you want to d dive into some of the uh, topics tied in with wealth creation and real estate or not but I uh, do absolutely <laughs> Let, let's go because that is that is a hot topic the first thing I want to say is I personally am a big believer in owning real estate I think yes. your primary residence whatever that looks like do anything you possibly can to own it and I'm going to say that there's some reasons behind that okay um, number one is it's forced savings the average person out there is not so good at paying themselves first, but they're really good mm -hmm. at paying, making a mortgage payment because otherwise negative consequences happen <laughs> yes. when, when you've got a creditor coming after you. So by, right. by doing that, it's for savings and you're paying yourself first. Number two, you need a place to live anyway. So why would you throw your money away in rent when you can mm -hmm. build up equity for yourself and benefit yourself from it longer term? Right. Number three is control. When you're renting a property, a landlord can boot you out anytime. Yes. And may, you may be the best tenant in the world and still get evicted. Mm -hmm. How, why would their that goals? <laughs> Absolutely. You might not fit into their goals at that you, time. You might not. The owner of the property may sell it and the new buyer may want to move in. You're yeah. evicted. Absolutely. Um, maybe they want to repurpose the property for something else. You're evicted. Mm -hmm. And 
when you're evicted, I mean, I know I can think of a friend of mine right now was getting a great deal on a house, a six bedroom house in Victoria, paying $2,500 a month. I mean, Whoa. what a steal. Going, yes. The current going rate for that property is between five and $6,000 a month. I believe it. That's crazy. The reason they're getting it so cheap is because it is a long-term rental property that they've been in for about a decade. Right. And rent restrictions limit the amount that rent can go up every year. So mm -hmm. awesome for them. And in that case, if they're disciplined enough to save the difference, they're actually better to continue renting financially. Right. But I don't know if they are or they aren't, but the average person doesn't save the difference. And yeah. what happens is if that property is sold and they get booted out, they are stuck. All of a sudden, their rent will mm -hmm. double overnight. Absolutely. I don't want anyone to be in that financial position, that negative financial position. What would you recommend for people that don't have wealth already? They're just starting out. Okay. <laughs> What's the best way to save for, you know, the younger generation to actually get into the market? Okay. This is scary right now. This is yeah. scary all over the place. Real, real estate is through the roof and, and it's just really hard for people to save up enough money to put a down payment down. And even mm -hmm. when they get over that hurdle, then how do they afford the payments? Here's right. where creativity comes in. So Amy, you're a creative person. You're mm -hmm. not so much in the numbers and the finance and <laughs> the, the organizational side of it. This is all about creativity. And creativity and numbers actually go really well together. So yeah. um, you got to so play the game, right? You got to play the game and you can get help for that on, yes. on the other side. So here's a couple of different ways that people can, can get started. When I bought my first house, I was 21. Mm -hmm. I had saved up some money and my husband, he was my boyfriend at the time, now my husband, yes. uh, had saved up some money and we were going to go on a trip around the world. But when we saw that we had $20,000 saved, we we're like, oh, we could buy, how we could put a down payment on a house instead. And that's what we did. Now, $20,000 today isn't going to get you much of a down payment. <laughs> no, no. For, for Not even time, a condo. Well, it could barely. Like if you bought a $400,000 condo as a first time home buyer, that's right. 20,000 will make it, but just. Right. Uh, back then we bought a house at 205,000. So Oops. it was, yeah. uh, I know, it's just. Ridiculous. Not in Victoria anyways. Yeah, not today, not no. today. But so that was great. So we, we had the down payment part figured out, but we wouldn't qualify for the mortgage. I was still a student working part-time, husband's working full-time. So we had my parents co-sign. Right. And it was great. So they had the equity and, and they were still working. So they helped us out. And we only needed them to co-sign for a few years until our income levels went up. Mm -hmm. And then we were able to qualify on our own and we could take their names off. Yes. This is something parents and grandparents can absolutely help family members with mm -hmm. is if they are comfortable co-signing. Um, and there's different rules around it. Go talk to your bank, go talk to your financial advisor about how to make that work. But that's it's, it's a great in. Now, I am going to share another very personal story right now. Okay. Um, which it's, it's my son. My son just turned 20 years old mm -hmm. and he just bought his first house. Wow. And, it's like, and I what picture him, just for the record, I still picture him as that eight-year-old that I initially met. <laughs> yes, he's, he's a lot taller now yeah. and uh, a little wiser, but he's, he, we've got, we helped him get his first in. Yeah. And my husband and I, we have not given him one dime. Right. So I think that's important to note. He has mm -hmm. borrowed. We are his private banker. And so what right. we did is we used the equity in our own personal home or our primary residence. Mm -hmm. We went to the bank and we borrowed the money. Right. Enough money to pay fourfold for this property that he's purchased. Mm -hmm. He doesn't need any down payment. And we even lent him a little more than the property value so he could do a few renovations. Nice. And yes, of course, mom and dad, us, we are also throwing on our painting clothes and we are in there helping them do the work. Yeah. <laughs> putting in the sweat equity as well. We're putting in the sweat equity and we're all working hard on getting this all spruced up and, and ready yes. to go, which is cool. So he's still a student. So we get so many people mm -hmm. asking us, oh, they, they just assume we've given him money or we've helped him out. Yeah. Well, we have helped him, but we haven't given him anything but opportunity. Right. And he still so, has to work for it. He still has to work for it. So he is going to own this home 
And mm-hmm. he is going to rent it. He's going to have roommates and they're all going to pay rent. So there will be rental income coming in. That mm-hmm. rental income coming in on the property is enough to cover the interest component on the mortgage, the property taxes, the renters pay the utilities. It breaks even. It covers the cost. That's amazing. Yeah. So it's a little bit higher risk because obviously if something needs doing, then we're going to step in and lend them a little more money. Um, Right. But when he graduates from university and then is working full time at that point, he'll have to pay more than interest only payments and and things Mm -hmm. will change. But we're flowing through what we were able to borrow money at. We're just flowing through that rate to him. Yeah. And we did it properly. We went to the lawyer We've done a proper loan agreement and we are mm-hmm. registered on title as the private mortgage holder. Right. And when you get into private mortgages, and this is where family can can step in and help, you don't have the down payment requirements. You don't have the CMHC requirements. Yeah. Now, there is a word of caution here. Yes. So this isn't for everybody. And, you know, I, I do caution people when you're mixing business and family members, yeah. be very, very careful. Now, a mm-hmm. parent and their child, I feel like most people I talk to, they just assume they're going to have to help their kids out. They're going to yes. help them with a down payment or something. This yes. is one way you can help them. You're still protecting yourself. If something goes awry, if he flakes out on us, yeah, we can foreclose anytime. And so right. then we take over the property and that's it. He's out. Yeah. Um, and so you would either sell it or have it as your own. Exactly. So protection, essentially. Yeah. So we've got that protection. He learns what it's like to be a landlord and to manage roommates and rental and income mm-hmm. and pay bills and sweat equity labor. And yes. so, I mean, it's just another way to to help young people get into the market. Um, and I guess, Amy, one final thing um, is partnership. That's another mm-hmm. option where, you know, either family members can go partner together on a property And Mm -hmm. you want to, again, make sure you've got partnership agreements drafted. The number one most important thing in any partnership agreement is the exit strategy. Yes. Everyone's happy and go lucky when they partner together at the beginning. Assume the worst case scenario, like a divorce, you know, like you just, it's a disaster and you never want to speak to each other again. If you can agree on what would happen if everything just goes south at the beginning, Everything should work out fine at the end of the day. Well, thank you so much for being here with us today, Sybil. Where can people learn more, find out what you're teaching and get even more advice than what we saw today? Go to thewealthylife.com. We've got all kinds of great resources, tools, um, webinars, articles, everything they need is right at thewealthylife.com. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks, Amy. 